the front entrance. Got these statuesque things standing up here. The Kleins have now put their own motif here, 2020 for them. And then the main entrance going into the hotel from Main Street. Now there's the side entrance. The original tiling still here on the side entrance. 1906 when it originally opened up. By 1907 it had gone bankrupt. This was one of the stairways that went down to the uh, Nevada Club Saloon at the time. It went right down there and turned to the left. It was directly underneath me to the left here. The other entrance was up here on the corner. On the corner of the building, here's the main entrance to the Nevada Club Saloon when it uh, operated back from 1907 to 1912. They're going to put another bar in there pretty soon, as what I'm told. Well, there's what the back of the hotel looks like with fire escape. Looking down, my truck's parked right there, right in back. It's either there or in the front on the main street where you have to park. Hold it, and I'll be there in a minute. Okay. Hotel Bilbada. Here we come. Nice place. Did a hell of a job redoing it. Obviously, this is not the original elevator. <laughs> this supposed to be they had the oldest elevator in the state. Coke elevator. Hmm? I haven't heard of that. Coke? Mm-hmm. Maybe a residential over there. What's our number? 57. 57. 52. Right in the front. Isn't it nice? It's a beautiful place, huh? Look at that. That's the one we saw in the ad, right? That we yeah. said this is the one we said that they better have a TV. Yeah, there's a TV. A second one. There's the microwave one. and there's the fridge. Turn on the light somewhere. I don't know where the switch is. Hold on. To be inside. This is a sitting room here. Nice little couch. And I guess this is our coffee maker and. Uh, Refrigerator looks like there's a bathrobe. A very nice place. Yeah, you know, there's another screen there, another TV. That's a bigger one. That looks very nice. Let's see. Right across the street from the old Jim Butler. And right on the other side is the Mizpah. Wow. We looked at this at this building how many times and it was vacant. We kept thinking, I wonder if they're ever gonna finish it off. And here we are. Before going further and to try to make a determination as to what kind of activity might be here, we need to take a look at this building's storied past. On June 19, 1906, the ground was broke for the new building that was to be built here. The Nevada State Bank and Trust Company of Tonopah, the building was to cost $100,000 once completed. It was the brainchild of a wealthy rancher who owned almost all of Antelope Valley. Thomas Brindley Rickey, who went by the initials T.B. Rickey. He and his wife were best known for donating the land that the Nevada Governor's Mansion now sits on to the state for $10. It wasn't halfway done and he almost died from pneumonia. But he recovered and in late June 1907 he posted the announcement that he was ready for business. Right after the opening came the Nevada Club, a very exclusive club in the basement of the business. 
at its opening, owned by a guy named J.G. Crumley, and it was 24 hours, just like the casinos are today. It would have been quite the sight to see. The club advertisements alone were very enticing. Everything was going according to plan, and then, disaster. A scant three months after opening, along comes the panic of 1907. Today, we call them depressions, and it's usually the result of a bunch of rich guys trying to corner a market and getting richer. On October 16, 1907, two speculators tried to corner the stock market of United Copper and flubbed out. It caused a run on the banks back east, and it just escalated from there. Ricky's bank, now just three months old, had done what bankers do. They provide a somewhat secure place for the depositor's money and then loan part of that money back out in the form of loans to be received later on with interest. So much for those loans. The local community made a run on the bank to get their money and of course it wasn't there. Ricky found himself arrested for possible embezzlement. A banking rehabilitation committee offered the depositors 10 cents on the dollars. The minor depositors wanted it, the major depositors wouldn't take it. So a grand jury was convened. Ricky was indicted. His lawyers did their job. Ricky made a second offer to the depositors based on stipulations. The hardest part of that offer to swallow was that before proceeding, all indictments against himself and other employees must be dropped. That went over big. Apparently his lawyers had him out on bond because another arrest warrant was issued. Once again doing their job, his lawyers showed how costly the trial would be. After a search, he was located a second time after having fled to San Francisco. He had sold all of his Nevada land holdings to a cattle ranch in California. With the stipulation that they send the cash to Germany, I guess we know where he was running from the port of San Francisco. His lawyers tried to get the case remanded to United States Circuit Court, but a federal judge instead kicked it back to district court. While all of this drama went on, it didn't stop the miners from drinking at the Nevada club. They even hired a violinist. Ricky rated his achievements in the state while the paper tore into him, and two years passed without a trial. In February of 1911, the town focused on the Belmont Mine Fire. Fire was a real issue in the mines and mining camps, and this particular one filled a lot of the graves in the old Tonopah graveyard that is now behind the Clown Motel. Unfazed, Ricky is still preparing for his big suit. By now, a new bank has come into the building, which has the exact same name as the old one. They just dropped the Nevada from the front of the title. On February 7th, 1912, the State Bank building catches on fire. Quick work by the fire department saves the building, but the newspaper reports that it was actually the second fire. I couldn't find where the first one took place. Apparently, it didn't make the paper. The fire apparently started in the basement. It gutted the barber shop and a couple of the other shops completely and made its way into the Nevada Club Saloon, where it gets considerable damage. Twelve days later, the Nevada Club announced that it was all cleaned up and back open for business. Apparently, the miners didn't share the sentiment, maybe because of the lingering smell of smoke. It went into receivership and in August was the subject of a sheriff's sale for the owed amount of $6,063. During that same month, a new offer was sent to the depositors of Ricky's old bank, and it was 10 cents on the dollar, like we couldn't see that one coming. Owner Crumley paid off the Nevada Club debt and changed the name to the Cobweb. Say what? I don't know about you, but the last place that I'd want to hang out in all night, perhaps making wagers and drinking myself blind, I would not want to be named after a predatory insect. Their advertisements were somewhat plainer than the classy ads for the Nevada Club. The building now began to fill up with professional office spaces. Not being able to make a go of it, Crumley now sells the Nevada Club slash cobweb. Six years have now passed since Ricky's bank went under, and the courts have now ruled that he was immune from malfeasance. Being bank administrator, he can't be tried. As I said, the rich get richer, and you and I suffer. The only jail time he served was in being forcibly brought back from San Francisco when he tried to flee to Germany. With the new owner, the cobwebs' advertisements would get better. And the new owner would invest in some classy furnishings. And classier whiskey which brought armed robbers. This article, requoted from a Finnish newspaper, tells how two Finnish men held up the Tonopah cobweb. That holdup took place in the preceding July. They fled to Alaska and one of them was killed by Alaskan police. Absent of the news report, the cobweb would never have known.
That news article apparently gave somebody else the same idea. Again, a few months later, the cobweb was held up. And again, in this incident, nobody lost their life. On May 24, 1916, the second part of the Old Tonopah Cemetery was filled up by the infamous fire at the Yellow Jacket Mine. And four years later, on January 3, 1920, the cobweb was sold out to a mining firm for mining offices. Prohibition was a coming. Their last posted advertisement simply sounded like the cartoon characters. That's all, folks. They would try to reopen it as a soft drink parlor in the bank building in another location, but to my knowledge, this was probably the end of the liquor license in the Belvada until the Kleins bought it. Certainly, until the end of Prohibition in December of 1933. Going into the 1920s, the building filled up completely with professional offices. You can tell which floor they were on by the numbers of the office. In January of 1920, the last article bashing Ricky about the failure of his bank came out in the Reno Gazette. Probably because they'd heard a rumor that he was in ill health and they just wanted to get in a last dig at him. Three days later, he died in Oakland, California. He died two days before the start of Prohibition. Well, here's drinking to that. I wonder if he ever made it to Germany to get his hands on that alleged embezzled money. Unfortunately, this is where our access to historical newspaper articles ends. I suspected during Prohibition the local newspapers probably went under. But in all of the newspaper articles I read, there were no deaths mentioned or anything else that could have caused paranormal activity in what is now known as the Belvada, at least for the years of newspapers that I was able to research. On their Belvada Hotel website, the Kleins make reference to a historical fact that the Belvada was low-rent apartments in the 1980s. I ran across an article in the Nevada State Journal of October 24, 1966, where the owner of the Tonopah's Belvada Apartments was complaining about the water rates for the unit. Now that's 1966, meaning that there were apartments there in the 1960s, maybe up to the 1980s. They were apparently there for a long time. Again, just an educated guess, but since they were there for a long time and the building at that time was going through dilapidation, probably most people lived on the lower floors. History records the Belvada as having had the oldest working elevator in the state, and probably it was like the Big Bang Theory in that it only worked every once in a while, if at all. I don't think I'd want to be riding it up to the top floors. Our opinion is that any paranormal activity from those apartments is probably going to be found on the lower floors, and if we were to go back, that's where we'd stay at. For anyone interested, UNLV does show that they have papers on file from Tonopah up to 1943 on microfilm, but with COVID going on, we'll pass. To the fire escape out here. You can get out, but you can come in. Yep, very much. Put our truck down there. There's the roof exit there. We're down to the bottom floor there. That's interesting. Why is there this opening in here? I don't understand the purpose. I don't either. Original stairs is right there. Original stairs is what? It's right there. See that that hole right there? Right, yeah, where it yeah. drops down. You think that's where the stairway was? Yeah. The original is. Could have been. This is too wide for an old For an old hotel, yeah. Hotel, yeah. This looks like it's new. Yeah, this probably had it would have gone all the way up. Like the old hotel like Virginia City, there's the stairs are so steep. Without well, they sure did a nice job of fixing the place up, I'll tell you that. Yes. What about front? Mm -hmm. Here, front entrance.
across the street there is the Mispa. And the other little uh, casino they put in there right next to it. The old vault door. There. They turned this vault into a sitting room. Very elaborate. Whoa, hard work. Very nice. There's the other vault door. They're still working on it down here. So now we're going to go down into the basement, take a look where the Nevada Club used to be. Nevada Club Saloon and the Cobweb. Emergency exit. Another vault down here. the ice machine next to oh, here's the uh, there's the street right there where you look up you're walking over the, the glass uh, little squares there yeah I want to say that this door right here was probably where the Nevada Club was at fifth floor. This is where the original elevator used to be. They had to take it out. It was just too old. It was the original one that was installed in this hotel and according to some historical documents it was the oldest one in the state, even older than the Goldfield uh, hotels. The setup in room 57. Here's our portable surveillance unit. Now using a fold-out unit, so it's all in one piece. The thing I have to do is hook up the cameras to it and go, and that even hooking up the cameras took like 20 minutes. Great place to put the DVR, right on that table, very solid table. Side of the DVR setup, that's the DVR right there. On the other side over here is the Xenix uh, Pro Amp for uh, supplying the sound monitor is on the back of the case right there all of the hookup is inside here i have a commercial power strip always purchase a surge protector that comes with a protection warranty but note that the warranty only applies to connected equipment and not to the structure itself but using equipment that comes with a warranty always provides an element of a safety net and it's a single uh, it's got one single plug that basically goes to the one uh, socket underneath all the wires that you see on the floor here are just uh, camera wires that are running out to the various cameras. The rim pod down here. There's our microphone. We got some cell sensors in the room. Camera there. Camera up on the wall there. One over here next to the DVR. And the antechamber out here. Another rim pod on the table. Cell sensor over there on the uh, desk cameras up here keeping an eye on both of them so that if they go off while we're out of the room they will register it we did have some very very light activity this morning but I think it, was, it might have just been them vacuuming the rug outside it's been it's been very quiet I don't think that uh, that there's any activity at least not on the fifth floor of this hotel this used to be all offices up here I think that the apartments were actually uh, down below um, and this was probably vacant at the time that the apartments were here, so I don't think that there's anything that could have happened up here that actually probably would have brought any activity to the room. Looking out our window on the other side of the street is the other hotel that we've done investigations at, the Mizpah, that's also owned by the Kleins. 
they've done a great job in uh, fixing this one up and also keeping the misbob. At around 3.30 on that first morning, the lines are all set up and ready to go. At 12.46, we left the room for lunch. I tested the rim pod on the way out. It wasn't until 2.30 in the afternoon on that first day that we got our first activity. In linear fashion, it appeared to pass through the wall rapidly over the cell sensor and onto the REM pod, which was probably its destination in the first place. The magnetic field generated by the REM pod appears to be a form of sustenance. By surveillance at the El Tovar Lodge at the Grand Canyon, we recorded something draining a 9-volt battery from one of the REM pods in 3 minutes and 10 seconds. Whatever is out there is definitely attracted to these REM pod units, and we consider them to be the workhorse of an investigation. About a half hour later, it comes back for a second play session. At 7.15 p.m. as the sun begins to go down, the cameras swap over to infrared. A few minutes later, we returned to the room and I changed all the batteries in the units, but we received no other activity for that night. Here's a good example of false positives. The orb-like objects going by in the window in the background are actually car lights reflecting from the ground below. At 9.25 a.m. on that second morning, the REM pod in the chair next to our bed goes off. Again, it seems to be reacting to what could possibly be the sound of a door slamming in the hallway. I don't know where else that sound would be coming from. It certainly is peculiar because this is the second time that it's happened. Following the REM pod in our sleeping quarters waking me up, the REM pod in the antechamber again goes off just as I'm about ready to rack the equipment up. Okay, there you go. Just because I start taking stuff down here? Yeah. Exactly. There's some stuff to watch. I already did. This time I tried to capture it on the camcorder, but as soon as I got close to it, it took off, which tells me there isn't anything natural in the hotel, such as door slamming, that it seems to be reacting to. Go ahead and get on that device right there. You were just on it a second ago. Get on it. What do you do that for? You just pass through the room for a moment there? Because there's activity outside. Very fleeting. So how did the Hotel Belvada stand up to our rating system? Well, there is some activity there, a little, but as I said, if we were to come back, we would focus on the second and third floors back where the apartments were at and not on the upper floor. On this hunt, we gave the Belvada Hotel an activity rating of low and sporadic. Now that we know that there is at least a little something there, we may get back in the future to take a second shot at it.
If you like these honest, down-to-earth videos, don't miss hitting that subscribe button.